Baldwin, take one. White people go around, it seems to me, with a very carefully suppressed terror of black people. A tremendous uneasiness. They don't know who, they don't know what the black face hides. And they're sure it's hiding something. What it's hiding is American history. You know, what, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it's hiding is what white people know they have done and are doing. You know, it's what, you know, white people know very well one thing. And it's the only thing they have to know. If they know this, everything else I say is a lie. They know they would not like to be black here. They know that. Now, they know that, and they're telling me lies. They're telling me and my children nothing but lies. For Baldwin, the truth is that the ghettos of his youth remain, gnawing at the spirit of those who live there. The poverty is piled high, making it even more inescapable, and making it even more inescapable how thoroughly you're despised. The high-rise slum becomes a high-crime area, Almost at once, because what are you going to do with all these children, really? Whole families condemned forever to nothing in the richest city in the world. My best friend, a black boy, jumped off the George Washington Bridge when he was 24 and I was 22. And I was sure that I, I was going to be next. Just from despair or? From despair, from rage, you know. Because you can get to a place, where, you know, where you're in battle so often that you—that's all you—that's all you can do. You know, you've been beaten so hard. All you can do is, is your world narrows to a, a kind of red circle of rage, and you begin to hate everybody, which means you hate yourself. You know, and when that happens, it's over for you. Baldwin has taken that despair and rage and turned it into novels, theater, and essays characters drawn from his family and friends. This fall, Dial Press is publishing his 19th book, a novel called Just Above My Head, the story of a black gospel singer during the civil rights struggle. church is a theme running through much of Baldwin's work. His father was a minister, and Baldwin himself became a preacher at the age of 13. His play, The Amen Corner, shown in revival at Lincoln Center's Black Theater Festival, was drawn from his own experiences in the pulpit. growing up in poverty, the church is the only consolation. When Baldwin left the church, he wanted to do more than to console. Often, Baldwin speaks to youngsters who grew up as he did, letting them know the future holds a place for them. On this day, he spoke at the Police Athletic League in Harlem. A writer might be a dancer, might be a carpenter, might be an um, architect, might be a junkie, might be any number of things. You think there's still a chance for today's black writer? There never was a chance for a black writer. Come, what's your name? Jeffrey. Listen, a writer black or white doesn't have much of a chance, right? Nobody wants a writer until he's dead. But to answer your real question, there's a greater chance for the black writer today than there ever has been. The children asked him the same question I wanted answered. Why did he move to Paris? Paris is very important to me because I was able to, um, well, I was able to take a deep breath. And I was able, this may sound a very corny way to put it, but I wanted to, I wanted to find out where 
being black ended where I began or vice versa. I mean that some things had happened to me because I was Jimmy and some things had happened to me because I was black. And I wanted to find out how to get these things together because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life going around saying, you treat me that way because I'm black. After attaining worldwide acclaim as a black writer, Baldwin wrote Giovanni's Room, an explicitly homosexual love story. His publishers in New York refused to print it for fear of alienating his newly acquired white, middle-class audience. Baldwin was furious and took the book to England for publication. You published Giovanni's Room very early on in your... I finished the book in 55. And that, to, to deal with homosexuality, it was yes. difficult. And you already were dealing with, you know, yeah. black writer. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to do that? Well, um, one can say almost that I didn't have an awful lot of choice. It was something, Giovanni's room comes, um, comes out of something which tormented and frightened me, the question of my own sexuality. I used to know when I was younger, a great many men, boys, who were so terrified that they might um, have homosexual and, you know, they might be bisexual, or they might, you know, want to go, you know, want to go to bed with a man. You might, might be able to fall in love with a man. And they were so frightened of that that they could never fall in love with anybody else, you know. They were so frightened of men they couldn't touch women. Giovanni Jun comes something out of, comes somewhere out of that. Did you also feel that you wanted to get it on the record your own homosexuality early? I don't know if that. Um, well, I don't know if I wanted to get it on the record, but I, wanted to, but I wanted to confront it. I'm very glad that, you know, that that was done, because it also simplified my life in another way, because it meant that I had no secrets. Nobody could blackmail me. No, you didn't tell me. I told you. James Baldwin is one of those lucky people who's never been unsure of his family's love. The oldest of nine children, he was helped financially by the others during his struggling years in France. Now he's in the States more than in Europe, and with his family more often than not. With the success of his books, he was able to buy a Manhattan apartment building, where his mother and several family members live now. Mrs. Baldwin's apartment is a center of activity for the whole family. Did you think he was going to be as, as big a success and as important? No, no, I didn't think that. But I knew that uh, he had to write. Barbara! Brothers and sisters and friends of the family were there. Nieces and nephews underfoot. How's everybody? <laughs> <laughs> he still can't upstage me now. <laughs> Conversation ran the gamut of subjects, but Baldwin's mood turned when we spoke of the American attitude toward blacks. There's a price this republic exacts. Any black man or woman walking, and that is a crime. I paid for that crime in my life. And I don't believe my countrymen anymore. They will not do to him what they failed to do to me. I was seven years old 47 years ago, and nothing has changed since then. Look, look. I don't mean it to you personally. I don't even know you. No. I got nothing against you. I don't know you personally, but I know you historically. You can't have it both ways. You can't swear to the freedom of all mankind and put me in chains. It sounds as if you believe that slavery put a curse on us somehow. Well, it is a curse, you know. Um, the American sense of reality is dictated by, by what Americans are trying to avoid. And if you're trying to avoid reality, how can you face it? You know? If you don't know what is going on in the ghettos of this nation, in the hearts and minds of, of women and men you see every day, you don't, you don't, first of all, in that case, you don't really know what's going on in your own heart and mind. And you have no way of knowing what's going on in the hearts and minds of millions of people on this, on this globe. You have told people, this nation in particular, a lot of what they don't want to hear. Yeah, I have. I've tried. You, know, you never know. But I tried, yes, to, um... The song says, wake the children sleeping. 
you know. But supposed to be a disturber of the peace. Still preaching, huh? Yeah. 